Hello and welcome to the PM Show, your weekly roundup of what's going on and new and live and happening, uh, or not happening in this case. No uh, Matt this week, because I say, if you saw yesterday's show, you'll know that he had a kidney stone that decided it wanted out uh, after being in for many, many years <laughs> at two o'clock in the morning on Saturday morning when we were all there. So um, yes, he was rushed into hospital and he's sort of been in and out ever since, bless him. But hopefully he's, he is on the mend uh, and he'll be back with us uh, hopefully next week very soon. If not, they're going to have to shove a Hoover in him, but we won't talk about that on this show. <laughs> it's going to be in there with a Henry the Hoover, hoovering yes. it all out of him. He'll love that. Anyway, just remember, when you take your tablets, Matt, don't lick your finger. Just saying. Yeah. Uh, right. Anyway, uh, what's happening this week then, Andy? What's new and been going on? Uh, it's fair. It's been a bit slow at the moment, to be honest with you. Uh, not mm. much in the way of um, new arrivals. We've got some bits and bobs coming in for... Um, that pre-orders are due in like this next week or so, so people will be getting invoice for them. Namely, we've got the uh, ICM Counter Invader. You can mm -hmm. see I've got a list down here that I'm looking at. Yes, yes. Uh, the Comic right. Camel, the Spitfire Story, Ghost of Kiev should be also in this week, the ICM ones, and also the uh, Intellary Sterling Mark III. So they're nice. all pre-orders that were previously had in that uh, should be um, winging the way into us, and as soon as they arrive, we'll uh, start invoicing people for them. Yeah, as always, don't forget, um, Andy will be in touch with an invoice. If you can sort of pay sharpish, it will help us out because then obviously we can get them out of the warehouse as well uh, to you. If you have got any problems, don't go silent. Just let us know. Sort us out a plan and we can sort it out for you. All right, so just simple as that. And don't forget, if you do any of the pre-orders with us, you only get charged when they are actually dispatched as well. So it's not like we sit around on your money or anything else like that. It helps with uh, my confusion levels as well when people all pay mm. together rather yes. than me having to keep going back days or weeks looking yes. back at them see whether people, are people up to see if they do or yeah. don't and all the rest of it, it so it's very yeah. confusing sometimes so yes definitely if you can do that that's absolutely great but say all those other ones coming up um you know with the pre-orders and stuff like that we'll get them all sorted so don't panic they are on their way as i say i call this technically time of year the doldrums because you know you say you get into june and I call the cliff in sort of end of May. Normally we have the bank holiday in the end of sort of May and literally the, the, the hobby world goes really, really quiet or certainly in the, the Northern Hemisphere because summer's here, you know, the nice weather, people are on holidays, there's various delays get caused through that and just generally it's very quiet. And then obviously as the sort of weather begins to change back into September, all goes back up again. Uh, we haven't seen it for the last few years purely because of COVID and we couldn't all go anywhere or go on holiday and that. But uh, this year, obviously, things are a little bit different. And we have gone back to what I'm calling 2019, it feels like. We've sort of gone back to there yeah. again. So it's almost like the seasons have come back. Where we didn't really have a season, it was just busy. Now it's sort of, you know, there's the peaks and troughs are appearing back into it as well, which is quite nice. The great thing is, though, is that you get time to do more modelling because we're quieter. Normally, it's busy with work and things like that. But we can actually get on with some modelling, which is quite nice. It is so Good job. Right. Okay. So uh, if we have a quick whiz around the actual uh, store itself. So new arrivals, as you can see, I will have these uh, up with you uh, as reviews. As said, I was up at there at the weekend. I have got back, obviously, the scimitar. That'll probably be up with you Thursday. Uh, and then, obviously, this little guy with the F4 will either go. I'll get it done this afternoon, but I'm not sure if I'll get it edited in time. Uh, but, obviously, it will be up with you this week as well. So it's two of the very, very nice kits just there. And as you can see down in here, we do have that scimitar. And yep. we've got the Daimler. Again, not a lot has changed in here, to be honest, since last week, purely because there's not a lot coming out as well. Uh, but as I say, some other things are going out of stock, as we can clearly see down in here, uh, various things. So, but as you say, this is the sort of latest things that we've had in. But again, we've got more stocks due in this week. So... I said, yeah, it's been a bit slow, hasn't it? And... Mm, yeah, very slow. So to the point you're like, Jesus, please release something. With... <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, but yeah, but the scimitar looks nice to say. I've got the review coming up of that one. I've got the Fine Molds Phantoms. I know a lot of you have been asking about a review to see those, see what those are like. You won't be disappointed. They are lovely right the way through. So we've got those ones down in there. Uh, the special offer section, this is going to change hopefully end of the week, isn't it, Andy? Yes, definitely. We did say, <clears throat> not last Wednesday, the Wednesday before when I... Where was I? Was I there last Wednesday? I can't I think remember. You, you were ill last week. Well, you were in hospital last Wednesday. I was in hospital was Wednesday, it was yeah. you, your turn in uh, hospital this week. Yeah, I was watching. I, I did watch the show, and um, <laughs> Matt did say that we we're going to update, that it was going to be updated on the Friday, and obviously then mm -hmm. things have happened since then. So, but they will definitely be updated for this Friday. We'll get some new specials up. 
so yeah so basically what we're also saying is if you see anything in here there's no guarantee it'll be here in the specials by the end of the week so if you do see yeah. something that you quite fancy grab it now because obviously uh it might go back up to full price in various bits and pieces yeah. so we get also the damage box section that's it the damage box there, well, yeah. yeah yeah so um, the, the, yeah all the other stuff like the edard dual combo and the um Tornado, etc. Those things that aren't damaged kits. Yes. We'll be going back to their relevant sections and we'll be adding some new bits. Definitely. And obviously, if you're a Top Gun Maverick fan, did he drive that one in this one? Because in the first Top Gun, he, he had a Ninja as well, Kawasaki Ninja. That was his original bike. And on this one, he had the new Carbon. So, oh, right. I've not watched so that's films, in there. Okay. So the bit where he goes down the runway trying to burn off yeah. a, a, a Hornet, uh, he was in one of those this time. So there you go. If you're Top Gun Maverick fans, that's the bike he was using yeah. for there. Seen it clip where, where he takes it. the top off his old one, doesn't he? Yeah, yeah, he drags it oh. back off of it. And, uh, I thought he just got, got on that one. And, uh. No, well, no, that's the weird thing, actually. Having seen it, it's a bit of a blur, actually. Um, but uh, seeing the film, I need to see it again now and sort of better appreciate it. But uh, you're right, he does pull off the actual tarp to it. And he puts yeah. on his old jacket as well from back in the day. Yeah. Uh, and then, uh, but the bit where he actually has a burn off with the uh, the Super Hornet is that bike. It's the new yeah. Kawasaki Ninja. But again, it's a what they've done is through that entire film is do sort of throwbacks to the original. Yeah. So that's it. It's a bit like with her, she's driving an old Porsche uh, in before she drove the really, really old Porsche uh, and various things like that. So there is little flickbacks, but the bike is one of them because they're both ninjas. One's the new one, one's the old one. So. But yes, so there you go. So if you see any of these down in here, you fancy it this week. Obviously, I'm working on the Jag at the moment, which is a great little kit considering uh, its age and the bits and pieces. It's a lovely kit. It's going together really, really well. Uh, and uh, we're doing that one a treat. So we've got both versions of those in as well, if you want to do the retirement scheme as well. So very, very I've, nice. I've actually been watching that um, build that mm. you've been doing. It's quite amazing, the difference between the old, the, the old way you did it and the new way you did it. Yeah, I know. Sorry. I said, can... <laughs> <laughs> Chucking everything on it, and sanding it back, and then rescribing it. Yeah, it, it is. For people who aren't aware, I'm doing a series of videos which I've got the original ones I did 18 years ago, and I'm doing a side by side build. So I'm sort of watching and commenting on how I did it, and then I'm doing it now in today's standard. And again, a lot of in back in the day involved a lot of filler, shall we say? It was a case of, oh, we we'll just fill it. And I'm, it's almost like cringe. I'm watching it like this because I'm obliterating any detail this model ever had. And it's amazing because I've actually got this thing together with no filler by just test fitting it, dry fitting it and understanding kits probably a lot better now, 20 years later uh, and going through. So yeah, it's, it's quite a nice one. And the painting's the next one. I won't be spraying this one at 40 PSI. You yeah. know, with clouds of dust and smoke flying everywhere and, you know, overspray. I'll probably use about a, a 1% of the paint I used back in the day. But to fill up a 5 mil colour cup, pss, that's one wing. <laughs> <laughs> you know, because most of it's got airborne. When you're spraying at that pressure, it's all airborne. So, yes. Or, or you spilt it, but you used to spill a lot in those days as well. Oh, yeah, you? I used to spill a lot as well. I didn't have a colour cup lid for a long time. That was a lot of the trouble. And you know what it's like? You're spraying and you, you just go that little bit too far. And next thing you know, it, you either it runs down your airbrush and spits all over your model, which yeah. is a classic, or you suddenly you've got it all over your hand and you're like, where's that from? Oh, that's because I haven't got a lid. That's because yeah. I was cheap and wouldn't pay literally, what are they, seven quid for a cap from the top. I think it's one of those things where people watch motorsport waiting for the crashes and they everyone was watching you waiting, this waiting is for true. to yes. spill out of the colour yes. cup and go everywhere. That's it. It's like people who have doing the shop games about some of the mistakes <laughs> I used to make or things <laughs> I would say back in the day. So definitely... Anyway, so that's your uh, your current ones that are up there at the moment. Don't forget, obviously, we've got the Mega Sale, which is currently ongoing as well. Uh, again, this does change and get moved around a bit. Uh, obviously, I was up at the unit, and I have to say, it's it's not looking... I, I, being honest, it was absolutely round the last time I was up there. Yeah. We have kits and boxes all over the floor. It was, it was piled up high. And now, if you would have seen the video yesterday of the actual the warehouse up there, it's looking a lot smarter and nicer. And a lot of that is due to this, where we have been selling everything off at 25% uh, to make a little bit of room for the other stuff coming in as well. So as you can see, we've got the last of this stuff is in here as well. When it goes, don't forget, it gets removed from here. And if you did want it, it'll go back up to full price because we could get any of this in again or most of it in again, but it will be at full price. But again, there's some really nice ones that we do add to it. So down in here, we've got the actual uh, fine molds uh, armor down in here as well. Crikey, they call that medium. You've seen the guy stood there? Yeah. <laughs> it doesn't look like a medium tank to me. That looks like a heavy tank. 
But there we go. Uh, and again, we've got the tiger. Uh, and again, we've got that tw uh, tw twin uh, as well down in there, the flak panzer. Uh, for the Vespid one as well. It's a what if one, too. Yeah, that's it. So, some really nice stuff back in there. I know we've been talking about classic stuff, so some esky type things down here, or not that one, that's the Shiba one. But uh, the Golf, I assume that's probably the old esky kit. Yeah, I think it is, I isn't it? I thought so, down in there. So, yeah, but again, some really nice stuff, all 25% off, but again, it will be changing around, and when it has gone, it is gone as well. So, if you're thinking about it, it's best to grab it before. Again, we just see we've got two of those in stock because I remember them on the shelf. So, uh, very nice as well. So, grab any of those if you actually want to. I must admit, I've not been up to the shop since Christmas. Yeah. And watching the video, I was quite amazed how mm. tired it was. <laughs> Do you know what? I, I, don't, I haven't been up there this year. That's the whole point. So it, I think it was up in November or something. I went up and, uh, yeah. to the unit last time. Uh, it might have even been October. And to see the difference, it actually reminded me when we had only had the store open a few months yes. when it started to really stock up. Yeah, when we first yeah. had it, it was empty. It was okay. So we never filled this place. Uh, yeah. And then within a few months, we'd actually filled it completely. But say last time I went up there, then we couldn't even see the floor. Uh, yeah. This time, yeah, it's pretty nice and clear, and you can go through. But also, we've got everything in sections, which whereas before, it meant moving. Everything got pushed along a bit and pushed along to make room, and now it's actually all got its proper sections down in there. Uh, and the nice thing is, obviously, the paints are all easy to get to as well now. So, I think it's fair to say that 12 months ago, hmm. we were looking at it thinking, this isn't big enough. Yeah, yeah. 12 months ago, we were looking at other units to double because up. Because it was... Yeah. struggling to but it was more to better it just needed organizing better and deciding mm. on where we were on to right which is what we've what, what we've been doing over What's this past day to day yeah months. no it's looking very good now definitely yeah. uh right okay so popping over to the forum uh into these ones down in here again uh i don't know has the order actually gone in now for the uh, quarter ton not allowed to say jeep uh uh, to fair, Matt's been handling that one, so I'm not sure. Um, yeah. I knew he was he was having to put them in. There was a deadline, so yes. I presume so. But we haven't locked it yet, so I need to talk to him to see whether or not. That's what I, I think um, he spoke to our supplier, and I think the supplier said to leave it open a bit longer. So mm -hmm. fair enough. So again, if you do want that one, we're not allowed to call it a Jeep. Clearly, so it is now known as the U.S. Army Quarter Ton Utility Truck uh, down in there as well. So, say we got that one up, it's twelve percent off. It's a nice big one. It's one sixteenth. Did Tamiya do a radio control version back in the day? Of the Jeep. Of the Jeep. I know they did their monster type type truck RC Jeep thing. Uh, yeah. but I don't know if they just did the normal one. I can't remember now. So I'm just wondering if it. Uh, I don't know whether they did a military one or not. They well. did the military one. No, not sure. But uh, anyway, if you are into your big stuff, definitely for you. Uh, so, yeah, that one's in there as well. Very nice. And it's only 52 quid, so it's not a bad one. Uh, the Ukrainian ones, I know there's a lot being said about these at the moment because obviously you've got um, obviously IBG and then obviously uh, ICM have released theirs. We think the ICM one is out any second now. We're just literally waiting for it to come in. Uh, but obviously we've got the IBG version of it as well. Uh, so that one is due in any second as well. And again, a lot of this other stuff we are literally just sitting on the lines waiting for, aren't we? Uh, yes. Yeah. Um, yeah. So the, the Spitfire story is, mm -hmm. is literally due in next day or two. Um, the Camel uh, comic yeah. is due in yeah. next day or two. Mm -hmm. uh, um, yep. Yeah, 432s are still waiting for. Yeah. Yeah, so bits of bits, bits of bits, bits on. Yeah, there's bits and pieces all in there. Uh, again, it's just it's one of those things. You know what's going to happen. They are all going to come in at once. Yeah, as so, it did. <laughs> it never comes in like one a week or something dead handy or two a week. They usually turn out five or six at once. Uh, so yes, we got those ones down in there. Uh, and then say the Spitfire one is due in uh, this week as well, isn't it? Okay. Yeah. So yeah, that's the other one that's due in. Uh, so yes, lots of stuff. Again, it's just a little bit quiet at the moment. It's just one of those things. Hopefully it'll uh, pick up a little bit. Uh, right, okay. Over to questions. In the question area, some quite a good ones in here. Uh, right, okay. Callum says he's a new subscriber. Very first time. First question. 
Brilliant. Lovely to have you here. Don't forget, there's no such thing as a silly question on the forum. Please post them up. Uh, and again, we will answer them best we can. Anyway, it's just about to start working on the 30-second scale tornado, which I believe Andy's built, which he has. Uh, yeah. I was wondering what aftermarket parts would be worth the money. He says he's already got the Aries cockpit set for it, and the budget is no issue. God, they'll never say that to a modeler. <laughs> okay. Um the Aries you de definitely need a resin seat without a doubt mm -hmm. yeah it's nice to put the cockpit uh, to put the Aries cockpit in um, yeah but definitely seats mm -hmm. but if, you, if you've got if, you know, if you've got no budget then yeah might as well put the cockpit in I know when I was building mine another member was building one as well was it Tony yeah Tony did a beautiful one as Can't well can't remember one yeah. and he did all the um photo etch flaps and things on it hmm. which were a proper nightmare to do for, i think hmm. for him yeah. but it looks fantastic when they're done all the all the proper all the flaps are all you know, positioned down all photo etch they look fantastic mm -hmm. um i don't know what else you would need really need for it hmm. it's not a bad i mean i know it's been superseded by the italian one but it's still Still Again, not a bad for, a, kit for an old kit, as we say, it's one of those weird ones. With the Italian one when it came out, you know, I think everyone was expecting it to be sort of Tamiya standard, shall we say? Yeah. And it ain't. It, it's a good kit, don't get us wrong. And it's obviously got all the improved details that come over the years. But the Revel one is still a good kit. It's a good solid kit uh, to yeah. start your journey. And obviously, it's a lot cheaper. So... <laughs> Um, uh, but again, it's one of those, you know, obviously you can go down the things of wheels because they do resin wheels for it. So I think that's the rubber ones in that one, didn't it? Uh, nothing the plastic that. actually. Are they plastic in that one? But you can get rubber yeah. wheel, uh, uh, the actual resin weighted wheels for yeah. it. Um, again, you can get various photo etch sets for the externals and internals for it as well. You can get, I think they do resin cans for it, for the actual yeah. nozzles. But again, I think they are really expensive, but it is a large lump of resin. If I remember yeah. rightly, I can't remember that company is now. They're very expensive. They're beautifully detailed. But again, depending on the pose you're going to have with them, because obviously you're going to have the buckets out. You're not going to see the I think that's anyway. one thing that's lacking on that kit. I mean, on the yeah. 48th, it's it's all poseable, isn't it? You can have yeah. it how you want it. But on the 32nd, I think they only positioned mm. open, if I remember, or mm. closed open, is it? That, yeah. Is that open? And that's clear. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah. <laughs> as it would be if they, if they were flying. Yes. As opposed, as opposed to landing, but yeah. Close. Um, <laughs> no, because it'd be open then. Yeah, that's actually, I can. Un I did wonder where you're going with that. Now I'm thinking if it was closed, <laughs> technically they'd be shut and in reverse. But if they're open, <laughs> so yeah, that's a weird <laughs> one. I'll give you that. <laughs> Whichever way. <laughs> yes. Um, but there, I think there's an aftermarket company that does those for it. Yes. Um, but they are not cheap. I think they're about 50 odd quid just for that. So, yeah. but again, if, if budget's no option for you, then knock yourself out. But well, like yeah. I said, the, the flaps do look really, mm. really nice. Mm -hmm. Photo etch, but it's a lot of work to get them done. So, a lot of bending, soldering. Yeah, you've got to be good with your photo etch. Yeah. Because again, if they're a little bit bent or something, you'll see it straight away yeah. because the way they sort of louver the door down don't they, and the, the yeah and the big as well yeah so yeah. yeah yeah very yeah. noticeable hmm. but again you know i'm not being funny you're saying like money's no option all the rest of it would it be a better starting point to go with the italian one because obviously that's got a bit more detail in the first place but again it just depends on which way you want to do it I know we're working on old kits, but you get certain upgrades on the Italian one, if I remember rightly, that obviously aren't on there. Because you get the drop flaps and slaps, don't you, on the Italian one? Yeah. Which are Yes, really I think you do, don't you? So, again, you wouldn't have that problem. I must admit, I'm just thinking from a personal point of view, I think I might say, well, look, we've got the Rebel kit, but it might be a better starting point to go through. But if also, if you've got it with the resin cockpit, then probably stick with the Rebel one, really. Mm. Um but yeah, it's it. It's a big old bird. I've seen yours many a time. Oh, it is. Yeah, I mean, it's 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 a yeah. hell of a lump. It's a huge mm. thing. I should I should have bought it with me. Shouldn't I put it on the desk here? But mm. yeah, giving it a dust off because anyway, it fits anyway. It's on top of my cabinet rather than in a cabinet. So yeah, yeah, it gets covered in dust. That's the only trouble with that one. I must admit, I'm, my uh, office upstairs now is looking a little bit like um, a ghost house because I've got little silk. Well, not silk, but cotton sheets now over my models. All right. 
because I noticed the other day up there, because obviously I keep my big stuff up there, my Millennium Falcons up there and a lot of my sci-fi big stuff and it proper, so I'm blowing it off and dusting it. And now I thought, you know what? I just put things over and people come around, I'll take them off. Yeah. (laughs) It's the only way of keeping it nice. Uh, Right. Okay. Bit of a question here from David and he's talking obviously about the new uh, F-16 MLU, which was announced by uh, Kinetic last week. Uh, yep. which apparently is going to be the next big latest and greatest kit from them in their gold series. Uh, but basically, he says he's got two questions. Uh, you might need to blindfold him uh, for the first one, make it a bit more of a challenge. Anyway, he says that he's really pleased to hear about the new F-16 that's coming out, even though that he's got the original one from a few years ago. The original one was a Block 15. Uh, I've got the Dutch decals for it. Uh, the link below is an interview with Mr. Raymond Chun, uh, the CEO of Kinetic. Uh, and he shows the images of the new Block 20. Does the box image tell us anything uh, if it's a Block 15 or the 20? And is it possible to with the outside differences? Right, okay. This is a little bit of a rabbit hole when you start going down block differences of F-16s. It's like F-18s because they are very, very subtle, but most changes, to be honest, are internal. They're not external. I think one of the biggest differences between uh, like the, the, the F-16A uh, type, which would have been the Block 5 and the Block 10, is that their tailplanes are completely a different shape. They are, they're not that sort of got the edges clipped out of them. So it's really easy to spot them from a distance. But then when they went to the Block 15, Block 20, 30, 40s, and 50s, 60s, they've all got the same tailplane. They've also got the same tails. Uh, And technically, from an external point of view, they all look pretty much the same. The differences come along, obviously, was that the Block 15 uh, became capable and Block 20s became capable of carrying the lantern pod. So they had hard points on the chins next to the intakes. So they could carry, obviously, for designating for Maverick missiles, harm missiles and various bits and pieces. Uh, But most of the stuff is all inside. So the cockpit, they had different multifunction displays, which are now full color ones, I do believe, uh, over the original black and white ones. But the biggest thing is the computer and the radar were all changed on them. So when they went through the MLU or the midlife upgrade program, they all got switched out for different bits and pieces inside. But from an external point of view, there's very, very little in it. Um, a lot of it is just mission capabilities that the actual aircraft gained with it because obviously we had to fire the AMRAM over the original, which couldn't, um, and obviously, you know, back in the day, sparrows, I think they could carry uh, and stuff like that. So from an external point of view, I think there's probably not going to be a lot of differences. So looking at box art as well, I would never do because you're not quite sure how accurate that box art is to what the kit's going to be. So I think really the biggest difference what they've done is that they've taken the F-16, AB as they used to call it, and this will be the more modern version. But from a model's point of view, there's not a lot of differences into it. I think what Raymond's been talking about is that obviously this is one of their gold standard kits, which the old one, Nathan's built, and it was reboxed as well by Italeri. They did a boxing of it. It's a bit clunky. It's... I know at the time a lot of people said they copied Tamiya, but there's only so many ways you can put an F-16 kit together, let's face it. So um, I don't think they did because it certainly doesn't go together like the Tamiya one. Let's just say that. Uh, The surface detail was a little bit soft on it. Uh, It wasn't uh, a fair representation, shall we say, of their modern kits. And when you see their new gold standard ones, and I built their Hornets, for instance, things like that, and the Harriers, they are beautiful. They are nothing like that F-16. So I think what they're trying to do is distance themselves from that old kit and say, look, we've done a new model. It's a completely new tool. Like Andy was saying earlier, it's got magnets for the weapons. Apparently so, yeah, yeah. So you can change so the, whole, so change you the weapons change over. The weapons over just at a click of a magnet, very Tamiya-esque for that um, yeah. and things. So, yeah, definitely. I think it's one of those areas where Kinetic, you know, have decided that's probably a bit of a, an old dog in their range. Let's get rid of it. And they've replaced it with something a lot newer. And because this one technically is supposed to be a Block 20, uh, it's the the more modern, up to date European Falcons. I think was it in the Netherlands use it. The um, you know certainly most of the the sort no, of the states no, around yeah. there, Norway and all of that, they all yeah. use that particular type uh, of them. So again, I think it's just it's one of those where to do a Block Twenty is current standard. It's pretty much the same, I do believe, as sort of the Block. Um, 30, 32s, 52s and 50s because they've got the same internals so they can all use the same weaponry and they all talk to each other via data link and stuff like that because they're NATO standard. 
So I think literally that's what they've done. So by them saying block 15 to 20, there's not a lot of difference. In fact, externally, I don't think there's any external differences between that those two types, between a 15 and a 20. So Snap Together, yeah, I've built Snap Together kits, like the main one, wouldn't it? It was supposed to be a Snap Tight kit. You still need glue, yeah. trust me. I must admit, when I first, when they were doing the original f promo things and you just saw the end of the nose, mm. yeah, it's like, yeah, it's before, the, before they actually officially released it. Mm -hmm. Then when it came out, I thought, another F-16. Mm. The but, only thing that's really nice is obviously, as we know, that the F-16s for the Tiger Meat ones around Europe, they've got a magic market. Yes, they can do yeah, some yeah, incredible yeah, yeah. options for painting because, yeah. you know, it's to say the Tiger Meat squadrons doing those every couple of years. They are absolutely immense. And I've been and, lucky enough to go to a few of the Tiger Meat, yeah. uh, you know, shows. And we were talking about the Tamiya ones being the standard, but they never mm -hmm. did the earlier the versions, did version. they? No, that's it. They don't do so, that. The earliest one they do is a Block 30. Yeah. So, and that does have a few differences. So, but again, it's one of those ones where at the time you think, yeah, it's another F-16, like we often say about another Spitfire, another 109, but that does fill a little bit of a gap. Because yeah. to say, if you wanted to do the European ones, uh, then yeah, that's the one that you'll be using. Uh, and most of those also, they have the, oh God, this is where I get really technical. They all have the Pratt & Whitney F-100 engine. Whereas, obviously, a lot of the American ones, although they do both, uh, they also carry the General Electric. Is it the 229 engine in that one? So there's a, a different engine for them as well. But the European ones all tended to use those. I could be wrong. The later ones might use um, General Electric engines. Can you see uh, words flying over the top of my head at the moment? Yeah, that's it. But that's just because I'm an anorak. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> so, obviously, the mouths, you get big mouth and small mouth uh, one yeah. and all that rubbish that goes with it. I know that bit, but... <laughs> so, yeah, depending on which engine they've got, uh, is known as the common intake system. It gets very confusing. But that's the trouble, I think, from a modeler's point of view. If it's not your area, it's a, a real minefield to go down. So, you know, like we often say is that most times, and that's basic modern manufacturers now, they know what they're doing. They've done their research. If they're saying it's a Block 20, it's a Block 20. You know, um, as I say, you could probably backdate it to a Block 15 very easily because externally there's no difference. I think literally it's just inside the cockpit and maybe different radars and software. So so basically no one would know if he put his Block 15 decals on no, a, block a Block 20. 20. No, no, definitely not. Uh, second question, uh, like all 48-year-old children, having just seen Top Gun 2, he goes, he needs to build an FA-18E in my life. Uh, is the Meng one the best one out there? Uh, by best, I mean the much needed, uh, much filler. Again, I haven't built it, so I can't totally comment uh, as he hates filling and rescribing. Um, again, this is one of those ones where I know people who have built the Meng one and they've said it's not brilliant. It's as in it's not just a, a total fall together. It does need a little bit of work to go in. And I know people who have built the Hobby Boss one and said the same thing. Personally, I prefer the Hobby Boss one. I think from the way it goes together, is a nice effect and i do like the way that hobby boss has got all the electronics base molded into it as well um so if anybody's ever built the old hasagawa ones you'll know the pain of trying to fit the uh, electronics base into it especially if you've got replacement wheel wells and a cockpit because you can't get all three in something has to mm. give so you have to end up cutting floors off of the cockpit and wheel wells and stuff like that to fit it all in this is all molded in so it makes it a lot nicer and easier to use so, but yes. Uh, well, at least he promises not to use the Maverick scheme. That's it, because he's saying on there that the the radar panels aren't important if he's going to do it. I think, honestly, you take your monies, you take your chance. I know somebody who I know and respect quite a lot, he's just finished off the main one. He said it went together lovely. Um, and uh, But I know somebody else who's built the Hobby Boss one and said it went together lovely as well. But then I've also heard the people say about, oh, it's got fit problems. But again, don't forget, that's down to the modeler at the end of the day. Uh, what about the kinetic ones? The kinetic ones, they don't do the Super Hornets. They only do the Legacy type Hornets. Oh, right. So they do the A, B, the A, A plus, B, right. C uh, ones as well. So, yeah. But currently they don't do the Super Hornet. The only Super Hornet ones you can get out there are 
and don't do it clearly the Atari one which is a very old block 10 which is yeah almost prehistoric by today's standard uh and then obviously you can go through the motions of you've got Ravel's one which I wouldn't touch either because that's a bit of a nightmare because I've built that and it's just not nice at all Hasegawa's is really nice obviously it was the old classic staple one that a lot of us built back in the 2000s uh for beautiful kit goes together but now it's actually the old standard um, so things like I've got the giant one in front of me here, the exhaust, uh, the uh, ES, uh, ECS pipes off the top of it are totally different now uh, and various things. So there's a lot of differences internally with the cockpit as well to the old one. Uh, so that's looking a little bit old. And then obviously you've got Meng, which has done all three versions. So you've got the E, the single seat, the F, the two seat, and then you've got the G, the Growler, which is the electronics aircraft version. Yep. And then Hobby Boss have done all three as well. And I have reviewed them and I've got them all here. So take your pick, really. So, hmm. Yeah, I've got the main one in my stash, but not the uh, hmm. not the Hobby Boss one. Yeah, I've got all three Hobby Boss ones here because I'm that type of guy. Because I must admit, when I did review them both, I preferred the Hobby Boss one. So yeah. I thought I'm going to get all three for my stash. And I've got about five uh, Asagawa ones. <laughs> that Asagawa <laughs> kit, to be honest, especially because of its it, when it came out, they did beautiful because it used to come with, anybody who's got one will know, they came with a beautiful little, I wouldn't say book, it's more of a booklet um, with all the schemes that used to come with it. Mm. So you used to get the Jolly Rogers, the Diamondbacks and somebody else, uh, the Speaking Dogs. But the little book, and I've still got a few of them because you might remember I did build a few. I had a stack of them at one point because uh, each kit came with them, but it was great for references. Because at the time, you couldn't get many close-up pictures of Hornets because they're a bit like the F-35. Nobody was allowed that close. Uh, but this book had them all in and on the carrier as well. And you could use them. They had pictures of the cockpit. They had the wheel wells. They had everything you want as a modeler. And they were absolutely great for it. And uh, they go together quite well. They're just a little bit modular. You know, you've got the nose end. The lyric system drops over the top like most Hornets do. And they can be a little bit of a handful just to get the alignments all right. But again, like I always say, test fitting, test fitting. And if you test fit, you can work out exactly where it's not working, sand it back a little bit, and it will go. It'd be nice to see you do a Hasegawa F-18 again versus... Did, did you ever do a video? Yeah, yeah, that? I did the Diamondbacks one, which is actually a commission for an F-18 pilot. Yeah. A uh, friend of mine. So, yeah, I did it to him. That's, a, that's his kit. That's an all pro modeler. So how you go back and do it now? My God, this is a start of a series now. Everyone's been saying, you've got to do that one. You've got to go back and do that. You've got to do that. Even Matt's jumping onto it saying, you need to do this one because I'm watching it now and it's awful. Like, thanks. <laughs> so interesting times. Okay, Paul says, question about setting solution. That is using Microsoul, uh, which works most of the time, but not all the time. I'm sure you remember talking about other setting solutions uh, on the market, uh, which ones are stronger, but I can't find that video. Um, uh, if you buy another product, sits on the shelf, definitely. Right, okay. So the thing is with setting solutions, like we always say, is that depending on the manufacturer of the decal will depend on the results you get because some setting solutions work better with uh, certain manufacturers. Like Microsol works really, really well with um, the, 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 the um, what they call the major, the Italian company who does decals. Um, uh, cartograph. Uh, cartograph. Yeah, and Cartograph tend to be with most companies out there these days. Tend to use Airfix, use them. I think Italy does a bit, uh, and a lot of the companies do them. Microset and Cell works great with those. Um, but other decals, like Tamiya, not so much. They tend to be very, very thick Tamiya decals and stuff, so you needed something a little bit stronger. And funny enough, I did bring back this week from the PM store, because Matt said give it a go, was some of this. So I don't know what this is like, so I will do a test. I'll do a little bit of an on-test with it. But this is their decal stuff from AK. Never used it. I haven't even opened it to sniff it. So we will see exactly what that stuff's like, uh, and I'll do an on-test. What I tend to do is micro set and so are my standard go-to type things. After that comes along X28, right? And if that isn't doing it, then I switch over to Alien Blood, which is the Ajima Hypersoul stuff. But this stuff, you have to be incredibly careful because this will actually melt lacquer paint even when it's dried. It's lethal. I call it alien blood because it's like acid. 
it, it literally will go through. But the other thing as well, if you're using the really strong stuff, if you touch your decal, you can literally blur it. It will melt because it's melting the decal. But there's still no guarantee. If you're having trouble with silvering, don't forget, a lot of this is the preparation. What you want to do really is rub your finger over your actual model. And if you can feel texture, you need to gloss coat it. You need to either buff it, as in just sand it and get it nice and smooth and polished. Because what you're trying to do is when that decal goes on, is push all the air out. If that air is stuck in there, i.e. there's texture and it's getting caught into it, think of it like sanding sticks. You've got a really coarse one and put sellotape over it, never going to work. You're still going to see it. But obviously, the finer the grits, and when you get into the polishy ones, you put sellotape on it, you're hardly going to see anything. But you still will see something. But obviously, if you put sellotape on gloss, you're not, you can see straight through it. There'll be no silvering. So it's literally that principle. And that carries through onto the surface of whatever you're going on. So we often talk about, obviously, setting solutions. They only can do so much at the end of the day. I'm a great believer in that, you know, if you've got a really nice surface, you don't even need any of these in some ways, maybe just to bite them down. But they aren't the golden ticket. You know, these aren't like the silver bullet that fixes everything. There's no decal solution out there that will work for all decals either. So in some ways, it's nice to have a little bit of a mishmash. What have you got, Andy? I would say that I think the, the main thing is, is when you're going over lumps and bumps. Hmm. Yeah, say on a wing, you've got like a yeah a bump over the wing, sort of like where you're trying to get it to conform over it. Yeah. yeah obviously, a flat decal going over like a curved surface. Mm -hmm. But again, it's just like it's just taking your time, putting a small amount on, yes. leaving it, small amount on, leave it. And mm -hmm. even if it's over a matter of days, just let yeah. it yeah. gradually do its thing rather than trying to mm. push them down or so, you know, cause damage to the decals and what have you. Absolutely. Uh, but yeah. my go to are again the micro set and soul. Um, also use these ones, which are probably about the same. Yeah aggressiveness is mm -hmm. set and sold but you know we're sort of slightly different on different decals yep. and also um again as phil said x20a because obviously this is a decal conforming over here over yeah. these bumps here and as you can see so that took about four days to get that to go in purely because obviously it was one of those where to start with it was just flat over the top and over time it beds in it beds in and it beds in until it's literally right the way over Sorry, camera doesn't like being that close. But trying to get them all to go in uh, and right the way over it uh, and things in there. It's never, it's not a, a one and done. I don't think there's ever been a magic product out there which you just brush it on and it melts them in. Because again, you're still going to be trapping pockets in there. What I like to do is obviously take a riveting wheel and not making rivets because you're just literally running it very lightly over the surface and that will release that air which then also gives the fluid a chance to get underneath the and as that evaporates or gets absorbed through then obviously it can drag it and pull it down but some of the worst ones is where you get lots of riveting and if it's quite big riveting you want it to get in those rivets and to go through so again sometimes it's just a case of a very fine pin and just pricking yeah. them in to let that air get out because sometimes naturally it'll get trapped in there and it can't get out so you are going to have to let it come through but the trouble is the stronger the agent you use the more likely you are to damage the paintwork or the decal itself so you've also got that thing about you don't want to go in there too strong to start with because you might not need it and i've done it to be honest the hyper stuff this is really really strong this is the strongest stuff i've ever used and if you accidentally touch it for instance you will just find a smudge on your finger and that's the decal. So, you know, uh, where it softened it. Also, it softens the paint around it as well to the point where sometimes you can actually get tide marks in your paintwork where it's changed it. So you've got to re-go over it or re-sort it out and things like that. So, but all of these things can be sort of, you know, bypassed by good practice of either glossing your model before you decal it or glossing the area. You don't have to do the entire model, just do the area or polishing it first. So if you polish it and just go down in there and polish that little area you're going to be doing uh, and make it nice and smooth, then you pop your deco onto it, then your solution, you'll get a far better effect. But I'm a great believer, again, some of the some things that I've been talking about in these videos before, I'd be chuck the deco on and we'll just whack it with setting solutions. But if you think about it, you shouldn't need the setting solutions because we've all done it. If you've built a model, like especially over metalizer finishes and that, you'll know I don't even put anything on them. I don't even seal them in. 
because they've got such a grip because they're on such a smooth surface that it doesn't require sealing in or it doesn't require anything to hold it in place it'll be absolutely fine so you know i've got the b17 up there it's a few years old now it's in all of these studio lights as well if it's going to be affected it would do but the decals are all absolutely fine on there and they're not any sign of silver and any sign of lifting or discoloring or anything else like that so yeah i think we're okay we get away with it Another thing to remember also is when you put the setting solution on, it starts to crinkle up. Hmm. Don't panic. Yeah, that's good. Leave it till hmm. the following day and then panic if it's still crinkled up the following day. But Yeah. But honestly, the thing is, like I, I often say, is that when you get that sort of crinkling effect, and it usually starts puckering up around the edges, that's where it's actually working. It's starting to bite and pull in. And it, it's dragging itself. It's sort, of, it's sort of contracting onto it. That's the good sign. The bit where, and Tammy are the worst for it, you put it on and nothing happens. You might as well <laughs> put water on it and you're like, God, here we go. And then I must admit, then I come in with X20A because that's quite strong stuff, to be honest. On the scale of it, if like this, you know, microset and soles are five of strength, you know, this is probably around about an eight. Uh, and then obviously this stuff's a 10. Uh, it, it is that thing of just working your way through. But again, don't be chucking loads onto it. Don't put loads on. One of the biggest mistakes I used to make back in the day was I would flood it and literally put a pool on top. But what can happen then as it evaporates, it becomes super concentrated and you end up with literally, I call it a fish eye or a bull's eye, where it melts the decal because it's contracting into it and you've got super, super concentrated stuff now uh, and you can damage the decal and you end up with either a hole in it or you've got, if it's a multi-layer silkscreen decal, obviously the colour underneath comes through. So, you know, you might have a red decal and suddenly you've got white coming through it and that's where yeah. it's eating through the red on the top. So patience. We often talk about in the hobby, patience, wait for filler to dry, wait for paint to dry decals to go down as well is definitely the biggest time where you'll be waiting for it because again that f18 there literally was probably i think four or five days and every sort of six hours i would go around it and you would see a little bit of silver in so i get out the wheel again just give it a rub over another thin coat and then leave it and just over time it will conform and you can get you know we often talk about conforming over complex shapes you know, you can get some really complex shapes and it will gently go, but don't go poking at it or pushing cotton buds because what you're going to do is tear it. And if you've got a gap, then that's it. You've had it. It's not going to go. But you can get the conformance around some really, really complex shapes. So, yes. Right. Okay. Uh, last up, we have uh, Brandon. He says, sorry if this question has been asked multiple times before. When it comes to painting ejection seat handles, uh what are any tips and tricks for painting them i'll tell you seriously buy yourself a posca pen and you just paint it black and then you just go line 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 i do it on all my seats now i did it in the f18 if you go back and have a look at the f15 we just finished i did it on that as well and it is the quickest and easiest way back in the day what i used to do was use like an infinity cutting board here and I would do a stripe depending on the scale, but obviously these will go down to, what is it, 0.4? Yeah, 0.4. And then same thing, you would literally paint it yellow and then put stripes over it. And then you obviously use the airbrush, a little bit of black and then undo it and you get all the stripes. But honestly, since Posca pens have got a very fine nib on this, you can just literally just go straight across and they look absolutely fine. And again, the great thing is you go around corners and complex stuff as well, no problem at all. So Posca pens are your friend. Yeah. And again, just be careful with Sharpies though, again, because they're enamel based. So if you've got uh, like acrylic paints and stuff and get a bit blurry, but the Posca pens, because they're, uh, you know, obviously acrylic, when they go on, they're really, really nice for it. And again, it's one of those cheap, quick hacks that actually I wish I'd known about 20 years ago, because it's great. <laughs> it's like two second job and it's done. Otherwise, it's uh, probably an hour masking up to get them to do it, especially on 48 scale and smaller stuff. Yeah. So yes, and that is about it. I think we are all done did. We are all good in PM land. So for this week, I can't think of anything else. Oh, the only thing is, don't forget, we've got the Gen 3s. So I've lost, there we go. Which uh, looked really, really nice on the rack, I have to say. It's very impressive. It's a big old yeah. rack. I didn't realize there was that many colors, if I'm honest. When I saw I'm it, up. the rack is the same size as the um, real colors. I did when I was putting them all onto the store. Yeah. <laughs> So it did a good job there, Andy. So yes. But anyway, we've got all, obviously all the Gen 3s, they are all there. We've got all the real colours with the bits and pieces. Uh, what I'll do is I might make a quick montage and stick it on the end of this video of the actual walk around the store. 
uh, mm. so everyone can see it. Because obviously, I showed all the members, uh, Flory Models members, yesterday. But I'll pop it up with some tinkly music as we walk around the store. Just a few bits that are going to go up for pre-order for members only, obviously, on the uh, Flory site. Mm -hmm. uh, the FA18 FA that we mentioned, the kinetic one, mm -hmm. that'll be up for pre-order. Yep. Also, the main red tails. The F16, you mean? F16, kinetic sorry. F16. Yeah. F16. Uh, the main red tails dual combo will be up for pre-order. Mm -hmm. um, we've also got the Infinity Models 132nd scale Vampire, which looks quite nice. Mm, yeah, we've spoken about Mark 3 and Mark 5. Yeah. Yeah. And also um, Gecko are bringing out a landing craft, a World War II British landing craft. Mm -hmm. Is that the one from Saving nice Private one? Ryan? Same, sorry? Yeah. Well, the one on Saving Private Ryan was the British version, wasn't it, that they used? Oh, was it? Oh, right. Yeah, yeah it wasn't that. the American yeah. one. It was the British yeah, it one. Yeah, it was the British one then, yeah. The people in yeah. the know were complaining because it was the wrong landing craft. Because it's right, the British yeah. version, not yeah. the American one. Yeah, the LCA, which we had here. Yeah. Mm. Oh, right. Mm. Didn't know mm. that. So, mm. yes, so that will uh, be going up. But it's fair. It looks, 135th looks quite nice, actually. And um, be nice for a diorama. Yeah, absolutely. It'd be a nice one. Obviously, we've just had the anniversary of D-Day, which seemed to slip through this year. It wasn't really spoken about much. Yeah. But, uh, obviously, at least we forget well, on that one. It was, it was used in other campaigns as well. So, uh, mm. yeah. Definitely. Good job. Right. Okay, then, guys, we will leave it right there. Don't forget, if you need anything, shoot Andy a message. He's good at that. <laughs> He's our point man for anything from PM as well. You can use the contact me clearly uh, over here on the store as well. So if you do want us to get anything in or you've got any questions, obviously, we've got all the details down in here as we go right the way through. Obviously, best wishes to uh, Matt for a speedy recovery uh, this week. Uh, and hopefully, he'll be back with us next week. And uh, he, yeah. just, he just needs to keep taking his tablets, doesn't he? He does, yeah. <laughs> I like the way John put on our chat last night. Does he have to do a handstand to take them? Yes. Yeah. <laughs> Definitely. Uh, anyway, right, we will leave it right there on that horrible thought. Uh, and we will see you hopefully again next week. Instead, if you do need anything, uh, keep an eye on this one. Obviously, I'll give you all a bit of a roundup of what's going on with the new sales and promotions and things like that on the Friday show as well. If not, we will hopefully be back with you tomorrow night. I don't know if Matt will be, clearly. You might not be able to sit down. Um, so, uh, so, yes, we'll be good with that one as well. So if you want to join us, we'll be live 7.30 as well on the usual place. Right, we will leave it right there. Thank you very much for joining this morning, Andy. Lovely to see you. Uh, happy modelling. Take care. We'll see you all again very soon. Bye. Bye.